being met for status as well. Mr. Pendergrass, can you hear me? I see your, your name's been there for a while. Yes, sir, I'm here. Thank you very much. Uh, we're set for trial in your case tomorrow. I know we have a few things. I saw a verified motion in limine from last Friday that we'll have the parties address in a moment. Uh, is the state prepared for trial tomorrow? Yes, it is, Judge. Mr. Pendergrass, are you? Yes. Okay. Um, one thing I want to take up before I talk about anything more, a while back I'd appointed standby counsel from the Public Defender's Office. For me, what that means, and I'm going to talk and make sure that that's what you want, Mr. Pendergrass. Standby counsel for me means they're in the back of the courtroom on one of the benches. They're there to consult with you if you need it during the trial, but you're not required to do so. They have not prepared the case, but they're a resource for you. Do you wish that to continue? I never asked for that to begin with, so. I know. I did it one day when you weren't answering questions. I did that. I'm happy to relieve them, but if you want them, I'll leave them there. I do not want them. Okay. The Public Defender's Office is relieved from appearing as standby counsel. I'll unappoint them. Uh, Mr. Pendergrass will proceed uh, self-represented in this case. Do you want to take up your motion in limine, Mr. Pendergrass? I've read through that. That was filed on Friday, and I'm happy to have you argue that to me. Absolutely. Is there an objection to it? Um, I'll hear from your points, then I'll ask the state as soon as you argue it. Well, if there's no objection, then it has to be granted. Mr. Halet, do you object to it? Your Honor, the state objects. Go ahead, Mr. Pendergrass. What are the grounds for objection? If you'll tell us your argument, you also filed it in insufficient time. So if you'll please give your argument, then I'll have the state address their objection. Well, the argument is, is there's no, uh, there was no uh, criminal complaint filed, no adjudicated facts. So there's no facts to support any uh, claim of any kind of uh, lawful arrest to begin with. So we have unsubstantiated claims. So truth cannot become fact without evidence. And pursuant to the rules of evidence, you got to have the evidence. So there is no evidence. So the man can't talk about something that doesn't exist. Anything and this else? is fundamentally and principally here. Typically, evidence comes into trial through testimony. And so tomorrow there would be evidence. Will you respond to that, please, Mr. Pendergrass? What, what evidence are they going to submit of an adjudicated fact of a lawful arrest or a lawful investigation? I don't know what I'll be hearing tomorrow. I'll be hearing it with the jury well, tomorrow. That, that, that would be the, the plaintiff's duty there to submit that to me, and there is, there is nothing. I'm stating right now for a fact there was no criminal complaint filed there's no adjudicated fact. We're well past a, a year's timeline for any kind of a in, misdemeanor. In, in regard, and you're uh, clarify in regard to the traffic-related uh, allegations. Correct. Any of them? None of them. Were, prosecutor never filed anything. There's nothing ever been filed. There's no no crime, no nothing. Okay, go ahead. Anything else you'd like to say, Mr. Pendergrass? Well, that it would severely prejudice me, as well as be misleading to the jury. To, to allow hearsay, uh, you know, those are, those are the grounds to limit this from being uh, presented. So uh, my, my request and my demand is that, that he be limited, the, the one witness they have, uh, to be limited from speaking anything about any kind of probable cause for what he allegedly pulled me over for because the prosecutor never filed anything. There's no complaints. Uh, no adjudicated fact, and again, we are well past the one-year mark for any kind of a misdemeanor. Uh, nothing's ever been filed. Okay. There was a formal complaint charging with resisting obstructing. That was no, no, filed. Excuse me. Uh, Objection. I'm talking about to support a resisting a lawful arrest. Okay. Because there was no complaint because resist, resisting resisting a lawful arrest, you have to prove that there was a lawful arrest being made first. So Give where's the adjudicated fact of a lawful okay. arrest being made first? I understand your position on that. I understand the point you're making. There was a formal complaint. You said there was no formal complaint filed. I want to simply clarify there was one for this charge, this trial, not for any traffic related offense, but for the resisting obstructing, there was one filed on November 2nd of 2022. Any additional arguments you want to make, Mr. Pendergrass? Uh, that this is all fraud. It's also fraud upon the court, which it was in my motion to dismiss, uh, which you disregarded. Uh, the fact is, is there's, there's no grand jury indictment here. The state of Idaho cannot be the injured party. They're not a real party in interest. It's a fiction. Okay, 
where, 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 where's my accuser? I have the right to face my accuser. This is, what, what is the nature and the cause of action here? Where's the accuser? Is the accuser going to take the stand? That's grounds for dismissal right there. No grand jury indictment, grounds for dismissal. You know, all, all these things that are lawfully supposed to be done following due process of law and the law itself hasn't been, hasn't been followed. So we've got deprivation of rights, fraud, fraud upon the court, the judicial machinery itself. Uh, there was no initial this appearance. It wasn't Senator taken Jeff, before a magistrate because, immediately. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stop you because we're dealing with your motion in limine. Those are issues that have already been adjudicated. So I'm referring specifically to your motion in limine only. Anything else in regards to that? You brought up hearsay that wasn't included. You included rules 401, 402, and 403. Uh, nothing under Chapter 8 of the Rules of Evidence. So this is something new you've addressed. Uh, Anything else in relation to... Rule, rule 901. So you wrote, you wrote 901. There's no documented proof. Which typically relates to self-authenticating of documents. You did raise that, and I acknowledge that as well. Anything else in relation to your motion that you filed? Yeah, just re reiterating that it's unfair prejudice. It would confuse the issues. It would mislead the uh, the jury. Um, and there's no evidence to support any of those facts, that there was anything. Thank you very much. Mr. Hale, let the state's response. Your Honor, the state would uh, object to this motion in limine. Um, all the evidence referenced by Mr. Pendergrass is, uh, it does fall within the relevancy and materiality contemplated within rules 401, 402, and 403. Um, and all of that will be addressed with the testimony of the officer to be presented tomorrow. Thank you. Anything else from the state? Nothing further, Your Honor. Okay. Uh, the court has read through the, uh, the briefing made by Mr. Pendergrass. I've reviewed rules 401, 402, 403. 401 is a test for relevant evidence. Uh, 402 uh, of rules of evidence is general admissibility of relevant evidence. And 403 is excluding relevant evidence for prejudice, confusion, waste of time, or other reasons. 901 uh, that was referenced uh, relates to the, uh, I'm going to make sure I give the exact title of this. It's generally within the authentication rules, but at least authenticating or identifying evidence. In this case, for resisting and obstructing, three important elements have to be proven. One, that a person who was resisted later or obstructed was a law enforcement officer. Two, that a person knew they were a law enforcement officer. And number three, that the defendant also knew at the time of the resistance that the officer was attempting to perform some official act or duty. I'm referencing Idaho Code 18705 as well as a multitude of case law from the state of Idaho on that. In the court's uh, perspective, context often matters in a criminal jury trial, especially in matters such as this, where an order from an officer has to be in the performance of some official act or duty. Mm -hmm. The court finds that a traffic stop leading to this is relevant to discuss whether the officer is performing some official act or duty. Objection. Officer, There's no adjudicated fact of a sir, lawfully... Sir, stop. It's my turn. I'm ruling now. I understand you disagree. I'm objecting you to your entering facts on the record that are not in evidence. So far, I have There's not heard no any adjudicated facts. facts. I, I agree with you. There's been no adjudicated facts. I agree with you. What I've heard is argument in the past. Your argument, uh, your verified um, uh, filings that were done earlier that indicated you were stopped for a certain reason in traffic, which led to this. And so I find that a traffic stop is relevant to whether the officer performing some official act or duty. An officer's duty includes only the lawful and authorized acts of a public officer. We'll be hearing about those tomorrow. Evidence, I had expect evidence will be given at trial. If it's not, then it'll be right for a motion for judgment of acquittal uh, when the state rests. In this case, a traffic stop is relevant in the court's opinion to whether the officer was acting uh, as pursuant to his duties and engaged in lawful and authorized acts of a public officer. It gives the jury a basis under which the officer was attempting to perform any alleged duties. It's beyond dispute, uh, and I'll quote State versus Hallen back, 141 Idaho 596, uh, pages 599 through 600, a court of appeals decision from 2005. It's beyond dispute that during a traffic stop, an officer has the authority to control the movement of the driver of the stop vehicle. And they have certain rights and uh, duties that they can perform during that. Also referencing Pennsylvania versus MIMS, 434, United States 106, a Supreme Court case from United States Supreme Court case from 1977. There is context that can be given 
I understand the point that you referenced, this is not relevant, but the court finds it's extremely relevant in terms of whether the officer was performing some official act of duty. Rule 403, the court may exclude relevant evidence if its probative value is substantially outweighed by danger of one or more of the following. And you've raised some of these, unfair prejudice, confusing issues, misleading the jury, undue delay, wasting time, or needlessly presenting cumulative evidence. The court may, it's discretionary in nature. The test is whether it substantially outweighs, the probative value is substantially outweighed by one of those. And the limited information I have, I find that it's not. Quite frankly, this is your motion, your burden to carry. You haven't given me sufficient basis to carry it. And so I'm finding that under 403, it's proper to give it. Now, the court tomorrow, when we hear evidence, can give a limiting instruction pursuant to Rule 105 if that is proper. I don't know if it will be until we hear that. And I'm certainly happy to address that with the parties if they find limiting the evidence to whether the officer was engaged in the lawful performance of a duty and that the jury shouldn't consider the nature of whether you were registered, not registered, or something else to that effect. So I'm denying your motion, finding it to be improper in this situation. Most of the things you've addressed as well, grand jury indictments, facing the accuser, other things, deprivation of rights have been addressed previously. The court stands by its decision. You always have appellate rights in regards to that. So we are set for trial tomorrow, and I plan to go to trial tomorrow. Trial will begin at 8.15 a.m. We'll take up jury instructions. I will have those for the parties at that time, pre-proof jury instructions, and I'll have post-proof instructions that I've prepared in anticipation if we make it through to the end of the day. We'll take those up. We'll also discuss jury selection. I typically give the parties 20 minutes each for jury selection pursuant to Criminal Rule 24 governed by the court. Each side will have four peremptory challenges that they can exercise. If the parties in consecutive order waive peremptories, if Mr. Haylett waives a peremptory and then Mr. Pendergrass, or if Mr. Pendergrass waives and then Mr. Haylett, that will be a waiver of any additional peremptories. So if you wish to utilize them, please do so. Four is the allotted number for peremptories here. This will be a jury of six persons. Objection. Right to trial by juries of 12 men of my peers without you whose unanimous consent cannot be found guilty. That's the law. This will be six jurors tomorrow. Objection. That's deprivation of the right to a trial by jury. Understand your request. It's denied. It's not a request. It's the law. You're not following the law. You're in breach of your oath of office. You're committing felonies, which is treason. So I'm accusing you of committing treason on the stand in open court. Denied. And I am not. You don't get to deny that. I'm accusing you. You can say what you want, Mr. Pendergrass. It doesn't make it true or factual or reality. That is what will be happening tomorrow. Which witnesses does the state intend to call tomorrow? Your Honor, the state plans to call Garden City Police Officer Bryden Wiggins. Is that the only witness? Yes, Your Honor. Mr. Pendergrass, who are you calling tomorrow? I'm not calling anybody. Very well, then. We'll also go over your Fifth Amendment rights regarding whether you desire to testify or not tomorrow. And so I'll talk about those when the state rests, assuming they rest and we make it that far through the trial. So 8.15 a.m., I'll have jury instructions left on the table for each of the parties, the same. We'll take up the issue of the jurors and the list that we have. That's available through the jury commission. If not, we will have a courtesy copy that we can give to the parties tomorrow. I'll give that and then I'll collect those after the fact, those lists again. As I said, my intent is to have the jury come down as soon as we can so that we can start. After we take up those preliminary matters, the jury instructions, the jury list itself, 20 minutes per side. And then we'll exercise peremptories and go straight into evidence, opening statements, I should say, and then evidence. Mr. Haylett, I'd ask that you have your witnesses here early, perhaps by 9 o'clock, so that they're available to testify when the time comes and there's no delay in that. So that's where we'll be. Mr. Pendergrass has waived his right to have standby counsel there from the public defender's office. Mr. Pendergrass, I will see you in the morning. Mr. Haylett, I'll see you in the morning as well. Thank you very much. Thank you.